As you're reading through the chapter on constitutional law, and hopefully as you're reading the text of the Constitution itself, you're going to come across privilege, privileges and immunities. You'll come across full faith and credit and the Commerce Clause, the Dormant Commerce Clause. These are vital to your understanding of how the law works. At the end of the chapter, or towards the end, you'll also come across some additional protections. And that's what I want to focus on in this video. Due process and equal protection. These guarantees that sort of hold the government to a line are very important to all Americans, and in fact to uh, persons who are not American citizens. The Fifth Amendment, obviously one of the first ten, therefore uh, one of the amendments that forms the Bill of Rights, and then the Fourteenth Amendment. Those taken together, both taken together, provide um, some additional protections that have quite a bit of Supreme Court commentary. So the provisions of the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments, the Constitution, guarantee that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So that doesn't mean that the federal government can't take someone's life from them, cannot take someone's property or liberty from them, but before the government can do that, it must give the person due process. And when we're talking about due process, we're talking about two different kinds. The first is procedural due process. The second is substantive due process. Procedural due process has two key elements. The first element is fair notice or proper notice, and the second is an opportunity to be heard. You should repeat that as a mantra. Fair notice and an opportunity to be heard. Fair notice and an opportunity to be heard. So before the government makes some sort of decision to take the life of a human, the liberty of a human, or the property of a human person, it must be done fairly. And that includes, at a minimum, giving them fair notice that this is going to occur, or could likely occur, or might occur, and then giving that person an opportunity to be heard. This is especially so in the criminal context, um, before punishment of, for instance, taking away someone's liberty and putting her in prison, uh, or taking away someone's life for a capital offense. Substantive due process is a little different. So this limits what a government may do in its legislative and executive capacities. So this isn't uh, necessarily in the judiciary per se, but in the legislature or the executive um, branches of the federal government. We have uh, laws that can be enacted, but they can be challenged, and they can be challenged on substantive due process grounds. So all legislation must be fair and reasonable in its content, and it must further a legitimate government interest. So procedural due process, uh, proper notice, an opportunity to be heard, substantive due process, outside of the judiciary, we're going to be looking to the legislative branch and the executive branch. Uh, are, are these laws are they fair and reasonable? And uh, is there a legitimate interest in passing these laws? If a law or uh, any kind of other action by the executive branch, for instance, limits or seeks to limit a fundamental right. Fundamental right. The state must have a legitimate and a compelling interest to justify its action. Here's some examples of fundamental rights. They include interstate travel, the right to privacy, voting, marriage and family, and all of the First Amendment rights. In situations not involving fundamental rights, a law or action does not violate substantive due process if it rationally relates to any legitimate government purpose. Uh, so what I want you to focus on here is uh, the word compelling when it's a fundamental right. And then if it's not a fundamental right, if it's not a fundamental right, it has to rationally relate. So those are two different standards of review or levels or burdens that have to be met. Uh, you have to prove that there, there has to be a compelling interest to justify an action if it seeks to limit a fundamental right. It just has to rationally relate to legitimate government purpose if it does not involve a fundamental right. 
the Equal Protection Clause guarantees that no state will deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So those human persons, for instance, who are similarly situated must be treated in a similar manner. Equal protection relates to the substance of the law, just like substantive due process. So what's the difference? When a law actually limits the liberty of all persons, it's going to potentially violate substantive due process. When a law actually limits the liberty of only some persons, but not others, it may violate the Equal Protection Clause. So imagine with me that the state of Texas decides that in order to get a driver's license, males have to pay $10. $10 a year to get a driver's license. Sounds good. Yet women have to pay $10,000 to get the same driver's license. So $10 for a man, $10,000 for a woman. Well, that's not fair in its substance, but it's only not fair to some people, not to all people. So this would be, you guessed it, it would be a violation potentially, and in this case, likely of the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, the same is true on the flip side. If Texas said it's going to be $10,000 for anybody to get a driver's license, well, that's treating everyone the same. This is unfair to all persons. This might violate substantive due process. So both substantive due process and equal protection clause, both are looking at the substance of the law. If it's affecting everybody, it might be substantive due process. If it's affecting only some, but not others, it could potentially be equal protection. So the courts have applied some different levels of scrutiny or tests for equal protection claims. We have strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, and then the rational basis test. Strict scrutiny is the hardest burden to meet, and it's the government who has to meet this burden. Rational basis test is the easiest burden to meet for the government, and intermediate is in the middle. So let's take a closer look at strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, and the rational basis test. question for you to think about is, um, when does the court apply strict scrutiny? When does it apply intermediate scrutiny? And when does it apply just the rational basis test? So when you're looking at a set of facts, you're trying to spot the issues, look for the exercise of a fundamental right. The exercise of a fundamental right. If there is an exercise of a fundamental right being prohibited or inhibited for some persons uh, and not others, the courts are going to apply the strict scrutiny standard. And under this standard, the classification must be necessary to promote a compelling state interest. Don't just gloss over that. Look at the language. It must be necessary. That is, there are no other options. This is the only way to promote this compelling state interest. So it's not just necessary to promote a state interest. It must be a compelling state interest. Very high burden. Uh, the opposite uh, end of the spectrum is the rational basis test. So think about classifications based on social welfare or economic status. In those kinds of matters, a classification will be considered valid if there is any conceivable rational basis, any conceivable rational basis on which the classification might relate to a legitimate government interest. It's a much easier stand, standard to meet for the government, a much easier standard. And in the middle is intermediate scrutiny. And if you think back to the state of Texas, charging $10 for men for the driver's license and charging $10,000 for women for the driver's license, courts would likely apply a intermediate, an intermediate scrutiny uh, standard here because the discrimination is based on gender. Uh, other cases are legitimacy, and that just has to do with the child um, who is or isn't born outside of wedlock, treating those kids differently that classification. So it's a higher standard than rational basis, a lower standard than strict scrutiny. And here you're looking for the language substantially related to important government objectives. So not quite any conceivable ration, rational basis, but also not quite as high as necessary to promote a compelling state interest. 
So I don't expect uh, students to immediately apprehend and comprehend all of this all at once, but as you're reading through your chapter, hopefully I'm giving you a little bit of the end in mind before you read through, and as you read through from the beginning to the end of your chapter, uh, when you encounter uh, substantive due process, procedural due process, and equal protection, you'll have a little bit of a context to help you understand more clearly what's going on. These are important standards of review for courts, and it's important for you to know uh, what kind of burden the government is going to have when the government tries to encroach on these kinds of rights.